Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to open the second annual conference of the Tel Aviv University Center for Combating Pandemics. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Itai ben Har, the chair of the center. Uh, I will be brief, uh, uh, a few housekeeping notes. So for the speakers, I know some of you like to walk around uh, when you talk. Please do not do that because the lectures are being recorded and you need to speak into this microphone. And to use this pointer, uh, upstairs there are similar arrangements to be properly recorded. Uh, coffee and uh, refreshments, I suppose you already saw, are being served down this hall. I wish all of us a successful conference. And I'd like to welcome uh, the Tel Aviv University Vice President for Research and Development, uh, Professor Dan Pehr, to say a few greeting words. Okay, it's uh, always a pleasure to be here. This is, I think, the second event uh, that we are running. I want to thank uh, Professor Itai Benar for leading this center. About uh, three years ago, really, during uh, the early, early stage of COVID, we got a donation um, that was without any purpose. And the idea that we had is to set up a pandemic center. Uh, thinking about the future, not about the present. So we were thinking that, you know, we will overcome COVID, very naive to think about this in uh, December 2020. Uh, but, you know, we were very happy from the vaccine. So we were in the situation that um, we thought that that will may change Tel Aviv University because it's a multidisciplinary uh, center. And uh, we thought about this pandemic uh, center that will bring together people from different disciplines. It's actually the first in the world. After us, there are three others that have been, from a university standpoint, established. Uh, one in Johns Hopkins, one in uh, Princeton, one in Harvard. So it's not, not good, not uh, bad places as well. But we're the first to uh, really utilize people from different disciplines. And I think uh, looking forward, we strongly believe, and I say it with a, a lot of pain, that the future we might experience more infectious diseases. We have other things to think about, for example, antibiotic resistance. And this could be another pandemic, who knows, in 10, 20 years. And I hope I'm not a prophet here. And I want to really, looking at the program, really wish you an exciting uh, day today. I see the program have really different fields, so it's really in the vision of of this uh, center. I'd like to thank Professor Itai Benar again for leading this. You think it's easy, but it's actually uh, not easy. Um, and also Yael for helping organizing and being there uh, for anything you need or we need at the university level and at the scientist level. And I wish you an exciting and really intriguing day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Peer. Now I will say a few words. I will be brief. Uh, the world is undergoing transition in how pandemics are percepted. Now, this transition was and is catalyzed by the recent COVID pandemic that all of us experienced. But we as scientists are actually undergoing a, a replanning of how we conduct our activities when they are related to 
let's say, studying and, and pandemics and dealing with preparedness. So this slide actually uh, summarizes what happened during the three and some years since COVID uh, became known to the world out of, uh, out of China, which was around January uh, 2020, if I remember correctly. And when that happened and when COVID was declared as a world pandemic, and if you have not heard since I think two weeks ago, it no longer is defined as such. So drastic measures had to be taken in order to deal with this crisis situation. Now, these slides lists a few of them, but basically from the medical treatment point of view, the efforts were, were centered on vaccines, and there was actually a revolution in the development on, and the approval of mostly RNA-based vaccines carried by, nano, by lipid nanoparticles that were approved in a record time of a few months. Medicines, so actually there was no time to develop new medicines. Uh, there were a lot of efforts investing in trying to repurpose drugs that were initially approved for other indications. Uh, but research began on identifying new drugs. And diagnostics, both at centers of diagnostic uh, tests, like you know, the PCR stations that we went to or, uh, later on, uh, the point of care, uh, letter of flow devices, you know, the stick that looks like a pregnancy test. So all of these were already based on existing technology that was adjusted to COVID. Now, the COVID, so formally the, the COVID is gone. Uh, so the focus of the world of scientific dealing with pandemic situations is shifting gears into learning or asking what have we learned from this pandemic and how can we use what we have learned to better prepare for future pandemics? And our center is following suit, so we will be more flexible in allowing non-COVID diseases. We actually did that already this year with the grant, uh, grants that we approved, looking at other infectious disease-based pandemic situations. There are a lot of pandemic magnitude events in the world like obesity, heart disease, cancer, and so on. We will not deal with those, but we will invest our efforts more into this learning phase, uh, making conclusions, studying for long term what we saw, what we learned, what was done correctly, what was do not done correctly, and so on. And that is us looking into the future. So basically, these are my opening remarks. I will now like to welcome our plenary lecture for today. I have to declare my conflict. I was on his PhD committee when he was a student, so I could have prevented him from being here, but I'm glad I did not. So Professor Cyril Cohen, from uh, Barilan University, did his PhD at the Technion, postdoctoral studies at the NIH, and uh, professor at Barilan University, an immunologist, uh, actually more a cancer immunologist than an infectious disease biologist, but Cyril was, so, but all of this is not important because Cyril uh, became known to the public during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic as an advisor to the government and as an opinion leader. Uh, and today he will tell us, I guess, things that we have learned from the way we dealt with the pandemics with a focus on vaccines. So Cyril, thank you for coming. Please, the podium is yours. So, Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Itai. Thank you, Yael. Thank you very much for inviting me. Actually, I feel extremely humbled because I see here a lot of people that I think would have done a better job than me in talking about COVID and uh, the lessons we learned. Uh, but uh, I'll try to do my best today. And as it I said, um, it's been three and a half years quite crazy. And again, I will talk about some of the lessons. There are many more lessons, I think, and uh, we can talk about that after my talk. But again, um, I think that we have lived something that is to some extent unprecedented. So the first lesson, and this is a quote I really like, it was bound to happen and it will happen. And the person that said that, it's me, five seconds ago. <laughs> and yes, I mean, uh, we, we are all aware, it's not like we are pessimistic by nature, but we are all aware that this is something that will, unfortunately, that may, happen again. And the question is really, you know, for us, it's, for me, it's the first lesson. We need to learn how to cope, better cope, with this reality. We don't know yet what we're going to face. But on the other hand, I think that we can derive some lessons. And we know that because there is, there were a lot of pandemics that, you know, human, humanity had to face during the history. I'm not going to go into um, all I'm not going to go uh, into all uh, the diseases uh, that we have faced as, you know, uh, as, as a humanity, as a group of people. But suffice to say that every few years, even if we're talking about flu, we do see, and I'm not going to go also into antigen drift and antigen shift uh, possibilities, we do see that, for example, for flu, every 10 to 20 years, there is an outbreak that is more severe than what we knew in the previous years. And therefore, for us, it's not really guessing, you know, uh, if there's going to be uh, a new, another pandemic, but the question is more when. And again, if we compare, actually, uh, COVID, and here perhaps I have some, I would say, um, some uh, uh, corrections to make because uh, this is based mainly on 6.9 million people. As you understand, we estimate that the, the toll of COVID, the death toll of COVID was more around 17, 20 million, more or less, based on estimation of uh, excess mortality, etc. But nonetheless, you know, compared to other pandemics that we have faced, to some extent, it was... I would say uh, something to some extent considerable, but on the other hand, compared to the uh, Spanish flu, it was three times, four times less deadly. But again, why we think it's going to happen again? Because we have larger cities, we have, you know, I can give a talk today here, and in 24 hours I can be on the other side of the world, literally. Uh, we have seen how, I would say, the ecosystem is changing, how contacts with animals sometimes is different, etc. And most of those pandemics have, uh, I would say, a zoonotic origin. And again, if I take you back, if I take myself back to uh, early 2020, so we start hearing reports of uh, pneumonia, bizarre pneumonia in uh, China, and actually, I would confess, and I said that, you know, originally I was thinking that it's just another flu, like a lot of people, but it wasn't. And I think that when, you know, the world coronavirus started to emerge, we realized that, you know, you know it, could it could go either way, or like the regular coronaviruses that we meet every year, or C43, et cetera, et cetera, N229, et cetera, that are causing common cold, or it could go to the SARS and MERS route. Actually, it was, to some extent, it was in between, but nonetheless, much more deadly than SARS and MERS. Again, we assume that uh, the origin 
was in bats because uh, some cousins, distant cousins, if we're talking, you know, evolutionary speaking, we're talking about 40 years uh, uh, distance, uh, were found in bats. But again, we still, we are still missing the intermediate host. So we're talking about, and again, you all know that, an RNA virus from the coronavirus's family. Uh, and one of the particularity of that virus, of course, or of that family, is that you know, they have a spike, they, bound to, they can bind to our cells, and of course cause, uh, I would say, an extent uh, of uh, physiological uh, phenomena that is not even clear today you know, why you know, such pathologies arise from this virus. One of the lessons also we can uh, take into account is that there were some slow decisions because it took to the WHO more than two months to declare this a pandemic. We can excuse that, of course, we understand, we remember that time, we didn't know exactly where it was going. It's a huge responsibility to decide if we're gonna declare a pandemic or not. But then again, there were enough clues earlier for, uh, I would say, the WHO to declare that and also a state of emergency. And we do believe that those two months were quite crucial and we lost time. So it became a pandemic. As I told you, we're talking about, you know, confirmed cases, 700 million cases. Of course, we all know that this is very far from the truth, but perhaps, you know, uh, in terms of uh, magnitude, you know, one order of magnitude. And uh, in terms of death, officially seven, we believe that it is more in the range of 20 million. A pandemic that, of course, was across the globe, a pandemic that was actually, uh, uh, I would say, in, uh, was or happened in successful, uh, successful, successive waves. Some of them were quite successful, unfortunately. Uh, uh, if you do remember, we had the wild type, more or less a D614G, but yeah, the wild type strain. And then in the winter of 2020, just before we started to immunize, we were exposed to the British variant. Um, and at that point, it became the Alpha variant. And then we had the Delta, and then we had finally the Omicron. And now we are more, I would say, in the era of the recombinant viruses with the XB, XBB. And still, hundreds of variants are developing, are now in the process, and we don't know, honestly, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So now the response when you have to face a pandemic is either do nothing and let it go, you are taking a risk, but on the other hand, uh, some would argue that you would reach more, I would say it would be the fastest way to reach a kind of immunity. I do not want to use as an immunologist the term of herd immunity. I think it has been used uh, too much and people have been misled. The second possibility is zero COVID policy. We have seen, I would say, three countries that adopted at some point this kind of policy. China, quite aggressively, and then suddenly they decided to drop everything last winter. Still, it's still bizarre, this kind of uh, behavior. We have Australia and New Zealand that fared not that bad compared to other countries. And you have, of course, the issue of what most of the world did, alternate lockdowns while trying to build immunity. Immunity can be built by exposure to the virus. Immunity can be built, of course, by uh, 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 um, vaccinating or immunizing if you have of course, a vaccine, and you are trying to flatten the curve. You know that you cannot prevent, it, is, it will be very difficult to prevent spread of the virus, but on the other hand, you want to make sure that people would get uh, correct care in hospitals, because this is crucial. I remember numbers like around 30% of the deaths 
in some of the waves were due not, to, not only to the virus, but also to the fact that uh, our hospitals were uh, overwhelmed and crowded. So, you know, when you look at the world, it's very interesting because you do see, again, uh, regions that did not experience, at least officially, a lot of COVID. There are some reasons, of course, in terms of death, I would say. One of the reasons, of course, in Africa is that usually you die of something, of something else, else before you get to the age that you would die of COVID, also, you know, distance, etc. But, you know, there are different factors. One very, I would say, uh, I would say one leader in that field, unfortunately, is Peru. Peru, there the death toll was terrible. Of course, also, all those numbers are dependent of uh, the testing, because if you don't test, as uh, Donald Trump said, you don't test, there's no pandemic. But again, uh, of course, you have to take into account life expectancy, you have to take into account access to medical care, uh, comorbidities, uh, uh, you know, another plague is, of course, all, you know, being overweight uh, in, in the Western world that also contributed to that. Uh, and again, there were some countries that did well with certain measures, vaccination, uh, we all remember Sweden, that compared to other European countries, was more or less the same, with minimum restrictions, compared to, Norway, to uh, the Norwegian uh, country, compared to Norway, Finland, and Denmark, of course, I had much more death, uh, uh, by a factor of 1.5 to almost 3. So uh, again, everything has a price here. And again, when we look at the uh, uh, response, and that's taken from the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, it was to some extent a failure, a failure of prevention, because most of the programs that we should have put in place for a pandemic were not put uh, on time, put in place on time. Uh, I would say failure of transparency to some extent. We all remember some I would say, uh, perhaps not here, but I remember clearly in France and also in the UK, a certain declaration by politics that uh, I would say did not give an accurate picture of what was happening to some extent. Either way, uh, failure of international solidarity to some extent, that was bound to happen also, we expected that. I do remember the case, for example, of uh, South Africa that early on told us about the Omicron variant. And I think that actually that was commendable uh, because, you know, at that time, you don't know if you remember, but we were freely, as you know, countries, we were freely shutting down, you know, airplanes from one country to another. I don't know to what extent it helped in the long run. Perhaps in the short run it helped, for example, in Israel because we were able to delay the arrival of the Omicron variants by a month because we didn't know how to react to that threat. And I, again, some of you, and I'm sorry if it's in Hebrew and some of you don't understand, but you remember uh, here what was happening, especially in uh, uh, March 2020, uh, when we started with the first lockdown. And we remember also uh, those images. I didn't bring anything from Italy, but I think Italy was one of the first countries in which uh, really we, we could grasp the severity of this pandemic, but this is in Brazil, some kind of mass grave. This is in New York, where uh, corps were held in uh, um, uh, refrigerated trucks. And again, that wasn't easy. There were also those kind of pictures. Remember, we were waiting in line to get into the supermarket, a cheap, simple, uh, you know, simple chore like, uh, you know, we need eggs, so you would wait one hour, just to realize that there are no eggs, unfortunately. <laughs> Which was very sad because my birthday is in March 2020 and my kids had to actually think about a recipe without eggs for my birthday cake. <laughs> but they managed and it was okay. At least that was a, that's what I told them. Anyway. <laughs> But what can we do? Actually, when we look back, I think that one of the things that we can understand as a lesson is that if you have to do something, do it, do it fast and, do it, and go hard with it. 
Because lockdown is terrible, and I will, of course, talk about that. I don't think it is a solution, or the solution. It might be a temporary solution, but it wasn't a solution, unfortunately. And I think that, again, when we uh, uh, compare countries that reacted quite quickly and countries that said, OK, let's see what's going to happen, I think that we realized that uh, um, uh, the countries that acted fast actually fared better. Again, there was also a question of wave. Okay, the first wave, I think it more or less took all of us by surprise. I remember myself giving my first interview in February 2020 in a studio, uh, in a TV studio, and I was kind of you know, I was just, it was on the day that they said that they will stop the traffic with China and with uh, Italy. And I was telling to myself, okay, this is rubbish. Am I going to say that live on TV or not? And I finally decided to say, I think it is very important to take precautions. And I agree with the Ministry of Health. But again, my personal feeling was that it was a little bit crazy. It wasn't crazy, actually. Uh, we should go hard. We should go fast if we want to stop and evaluate. But then again, uh, the question is how all those interventions are efficient. And when we look, uh, we do see that, for example, canceling small gathering. OK, so this is, just so you understand, so this is no change in the R. And that would be a reduction in the R, uh, uh, which is uh, the coefficient of I'm sorry. Uh, I can give you the formula, of course, of the R. But, uh, but again, so uh, uh, the R naught. So basically, you see that small gatherings had an impact. Closing educational institutions, not that much. And I will get back to that, because I think that it was a terrible thing we did to close uh, schools. I was at the Knesset arguing for not closing, at least, or finding solutions. We could have found solutions. We could have maintained education, at least for the youngest ones, uh, in terms of air purification and circulation, etc. I think that, especially in a country where it's not that, I would say, cold, uh, I think that there were some solutions that, unfortunately, we didn't adapt, and our kids paid a dear price. A dire price. And uh, of course, national lockdowns, basically, some would argue, again, depends which lockdown, that the impact was minimal. Uh, question is, again, where does it come from, that virus? And the assumption is that it is linked, and again, I'm not, as you may understand, into conspiracy theories, not that much. But uh, the question is, where, where did it come from? So I would say that the leading possibility right now is that, of course, it emerged in Wuhan, in that market, with close contact with animals. There was a recent paper about testing the animals. Not a lot of us are really convinced by the results, but it looks like it was the epicenter. I don't know if the origin of that uh, uh, pandemic, again, there is also the possibility that it is a lab leak. I don't, and I'll say that, I do not believe that it was an engineered virus because, you know, if we were to engineer viruses, we would have done that, I guess, a little bit, uh, I don't want to say better, but differently. Uh, but I do believe, and again, it's a belief, and I'm a scientist. <laughs> but I do think that, uh, you know, there is some possibility to some extent that, you know, by culturing viruses and, you know, those viruses that you will you know, isolate from bats in a mine in China or wherever, and you will try to study them, perhaps, and I'm really saying perhaps, uh, this might have ended up in a lab leak. I honestly, I don't know. I'm not sure even if we will know. Uh, point is that we don't know what the intermediate 
post is. I don't know if we will know it soon. For SARS, for example, it took 14 years, because the first SARS in 2002, 2003, it took 14 years to find the civet as the intermediate host. So I don't know if we will find the intermediate host here. But again, it's history. Again, other you know, interesting things. The first case most likely was identified in China in, on December 1st. So it means that first infection was around perhaps mid-November. But there are, again, some reports that show that people in Italy uh, on, in October already, when they were serologically tested, had some antibodies, IgM actually, so for those of you who are not immunologists, IgM is the first antibody that we rise against a new pathogen. So there are some possibilities that the virus was slowly disseminating at that time. And again, this is one report. It would be very interesting to see if other people that have samples might reach the same conclusion. I don't know. But again, lockdowns were quite, I would say, drastic, especially in China and then in other countries. This is in Wuhan, actually. And this is really a terrible tool. Um, again, they brought social isolation. I see that my mother didn't. Uh, and it's a personal thing, but I can say that my mother didn't get out of her place during two and a half years, for two and a half years. Uh, she even did not permit me uh, um, to get there, to come and visit her. And actually, the only way for her to see me was for me to be on TV. So that was one of my motivations, I have to tell you. And I'm not joking. <laughs> um, and uh, again, health problem, mental problem, delay. In diagnostics, we do believe that, unfortunately, if I take that more to another of my, I mean, to my field of expertise, you know, tumor immunology and immunotherapy, we do know that some patients didn't get the right care at the right, at the right time. I know personally someone like that because people were afraid to go in ho to hospitals, etc. Inequalities, again, this exacerbates inequalities uh, because there are some people that can work from home but there are some people that cannot work from home. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, economic downturns. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it happened. Perhaps the first lockdown was justified. After that, I don't know to what extent it really helped. Testing was, if we're talking about lessons, yeah, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> Testing, actually, the first, you know, when I did my fir the first P PCR testing was in France. I, I went there for a conference to talk about vaccination. I met with uh, colleagues and officials from the government, etc. And I had to take the plane back. And that's how I discovered that in France, you know, here they were like uh, just, you know, it's the tip of the nose. In France, they could reach to your brain. <laughs> and it was honestly a difficult experience. So I do feel for her, her or him, her, yeah, her. And, uh, but basically, that was one of the main problems we had. It was testing and tracing fast. And even, I have to tell you, in other countries, there were already lateral flow testing and what we call antigenic testing here. I do not understand why it was. It took so much time to get those tests to Israel. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, if we are to face again a pandemic, one of the things that we need to work on is uh, a rapid capacity of testing, an accurate capacity of testing. It shouldn't be a problem if you have the sequence of the virus, uh, if it's a virus, of course. And therefore, we need to invest in that. So we know that there were a lot of waves and a lot of actually variants. I'm not going to go over all those colors and tell you what's this, what you know each variant is. Okay, the British, the Delta, etc., the BA1, BA2. You know, I went over. Okay, but 
it's constantly mutating, it's constantly changing. So how did we get over that, more or less? Three factors, vaccines against mainly severe disease, treatments for people that do not respond to vaccines, and yes, Omicron. Omicron was actually the solution. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was, I don't want to say the best vaccines because uh, I'm not, and I was once on Fox News and they kind of <laughs> twisted my words. So I'm not encouraging anyone to get, you know, to take the chance to get immunized using the virus, especially, you know, but it's, it's a fact, okay? After Omicron, most of the population, and Omicron is a broad word for a lot of viruses, but uh, after Omicron, uh, most of uh, uh, the population was kind of, or acquired a kind of what we call hybrid immunity. Uh, also, people say vaccine. How did we get the vaccine so fast? Again, there were 200 vaccines that were developed. The mRNA technology was already uh, uh, available. I remember myself, you know, in one of the committees in the Ministry of Health, you know, beef, well before COVID, we, were, we uh, were discussing the approval of a cancer vaccines in the form of mRNA. Uh, uh, so that technology was known also in human, but not to that extent. We had previous knowledge of SARS and MERS. We know that the, the Achilles heel of uh, those viruses was a spike in terms of antigen. And uh, we did shorten the bureaucracy uh, and we had a large number of subjects that were exposed quite readily to the virus. So you could, get, you could reach conclusions quite fast in terms of the efficacy of the vaccines. A lot of platforms were developed. I'm not going to go into that because I will uh, uh, I will try to focus on other subjects, but the vaccine actually, and this is, again, this is an achievement. However, we look at it within a year or even a little bit less to get a vaccine. This is the first person to get vaccinated actually in the UK. UK was the first country, Western nation, sorry. First Western nation that gave vaccines. But again, there were a lot of vaccines. Uh, mRNA vaccines were quite, I would say, uh, 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 successful. We had also the inactivated vaccines, for example, from uh, China. And we had also other vaccines like the adeno-based vaccines that to some extent were perhaps to some extent successful, but with some side effects that actually prompted a shift toward mRNA vaccine. Israel was at the forefront of vaccination. I do remember myself in the French TV media when I was talking about 20% of the population, they were more or less talking about 20 people that got the vaccines in France. It was kind of, uh, I would say, uh, something unprecedented in Israel. It's a lively market. It's not done. People are still trying to develop vaccines uh, in different forms, uh, new generations. We had our also uh, uh, local vaccine development and here, I know a lot of people from the IIB are here and I want to extend my admiration. I had the privilege to go there and see what they did. And I really think that it was a, a great thing that they tried to achieve. And I do believe that Israel needs its own vaccine production facility because as we said, it's not the last pandemic, unfortunately, and we need to invest in that. But again, talking about investment, now people are evaluating new kinds of vaccines, trying to uh, I would say target other proteins than the spike protein, trying to use self-amplifying RNAs. There are some trials, there were early on trials with self-amplifying RNA. It will, it will help because we will not need to produce as much vaccine as we needed uh, uh, for regular mRNA if they are uh, self-amplifying. Again, uh, this has to prove, of course, efficient. And we'll see that, I guess, in the next few months. Nanoparticle platforms, uh, we are also looking uh, at nanoparticles uh, in my laboratory in terms of uh, producing new vaccines. But I think that one of the most important things that we need to achieve is, of course, nasal vaccines. Because, to tell the truth, we all know that vaccines do not stop transmission. Okay, They can perhaps reduce it in the first few months, but they will not stop the transmission 
of the virus, and we do believe that by acquiring uh, uh, mucosal immunity, we'll be able to get a better outcome in terms of controlling the pandemic. And yes, those vaccines arrived to Israel. It was like, uh, <laughs> uh, like a VIP. I, I never saw you know, the prime minister um, getting to the airport in order to get some uh, shipment. Huh? Yeah, I know, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Where is my AliExpress? Uh... <laughs> ah, it's not that. Okay, I'm going back home. Okay. Anyway, but again, another personal example. I think that actually it, it was important compared to other countries, uh, you know, that he got uh, his uh, first shot uh, uh, in Shiba Medical Center. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 memorable. I would say, uh, um, event. But again, uh, quite, quite fast. Uh, vaccines were extended to, I would say, most of the population. I think Israel was a success. We know that in terms of vaccination because we had doses uh, and we had also, you know, an excellent logistics uh, with 400 vaccination centers that were established within a few days, uh, digitalized system that actually made the difference between us and other countries that also were candidate to get those vaccines. Uh, the structure of the HMOs, of the Kupot Cholim, some kind of a little bit of competitions, and uh, also the willingness of the people here in Israel to get vaccinated. Because if you compare what you know, was happening in other countries, uh, I will take France, for example, a third of the people say that they will not get vaccinated. At the end of the day, they, you know, uh, some of them got vaccinated. But I think that in Israel, one of the things that helped was the positive attitude to vaccination of most of the population, most. So Israel really was at the forefront of vaccination because, you know, we reached uh, when, when other countries, you know, uh, uh, started to, va to immunize, we were at 50% of the whole population vaccinated, especially in what was important was protecting our, uh, 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 the elderly. This is, you know, for example, you know, uh, more than 90% of people above the age of 70, 95%, I think, again, uh, uh, got vaccinated. We slowly reopened uh, um, and uh, we were able to overcome, I guess, uh, uh, I would say that difficult time that we had. A lot of optimism, of course, because it was working. We started to see a difference be between vaccinated people and unvaccinated people in terms of uh, severe disease. All around the world, I was talking about Israel, even in France, I never said that, I will translate that. We have uh, vanquished the virus. I never said that, but you know how the media works. But then we have a problem. Uh, and that's, that's the day after that also in France. <laughs> so, the Delta is uh, arrived to Israel uh, and we started to get reports that, you know, vaccination might not stop the Delta variant. And I remember that graph, or at least the data, I think, I, Gili, we were together with the prime minister, you remember? We, we saw that data and, and we were kind of shocked that that was happening, mainly that people that got vaccinated early were reinfected or the efficacy of the vaccine, effectiveness, sorry, of the vaccine was quite low for people that got vaccinated in January, like 16%. Again, still protection from severe disease. So that's when we did two things. We decided on the third dose, and we also realized that vaccination might not stop transmission efficiently. So there were a lot uh, 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 of uh, uh, studies done, especially in Israel with the third dose, because we were at the for forefront. It was a difficult decision, but uh, I guess uh, a success. Uh, uh, and this is one of many papers that uh, were published uh, um, in, in, in that subject. And again, we did see uh, a positive outcome of three doses versus two doses. But of course, we also noted some side effects. 
And yes, there are side effects to vaccines. Uh, most of them, I would say, uh, were known, but myocarditis, of course, is a frequency, it's a, it's a reality. It's not a conspiracy theory. Israel already in June 2021 signaled that. Uh, we know other, uh, 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 um, I would say, syndromes, and that's why we need, and again, we need better information. I think that uh, if there is another lesson that we have to take into account, I think that the system of reporting at the beginning side effects was not that efficient, to say the least. So we need to better understand how it works. But again, we have moved forward to other, I would say, uh, doses or additional doses, and now with bivalent uh, vaccines. Uh, and again, one of the questions that we're still asking ourselves, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, but I started late, OK, because there was a technical problem. OK, I'll do my best to talk fast. Thank you very much. I know I could get more minutes from you. Anyway, um, question is how fast, how quickly immunity fades, OK? So basically, we do believe that hybrid immunity is a good thing. And based on several studies, might fade within eight months. But again, it's also dependent on the type of variant that we are encountering. So I think it's, it's very difficult to say uh, to what extent or for how long we are protected after we get a virus. But again, most likely for the vulnerable people, uh, it might be uh, a good thing to get vaccinated every year because, again, for vulnerable people, COVID has, even Omicron, has terrible consequences. And again, as I told you, we understand that they cannot prevent uh, contamination efficiently but they do reduce severe disease. And it, is, it has been estimated that between 20 to 30 million lives were saved worldwide. Risk factors, we know that today, overweight, diabetes, immunocompromised people, aged people, vaccination status also is important, vaccinated or unvaccinated comorbidities, but also recent paper from three, four days ago, five days ago, it was uh, Friday in Nature, that uh, perhaps isolated some of the genetic factors that are responsible for severe disease, inflammatory signaling, uh, uh, immunometabolism, which is in itself very interesting. So we need to understand better. Long COVID, long COVID is a, is a problem, okay? We can argue if it's 3% of the population, 2% of the population, 10% of the population, like in this paper that was also published on Friday, uh, now, long COVID has a new name. It's post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. But nonetheless, it is a, a, a problem. We need to better understand what is happening because it can affect heart, lungs, the immune system, actually, uh, blood vessels. Uh, people will experience fatigue, cognitive impairment, uh, 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 ED, nausea, nausea and there are still a lot of hypotheses for what is causing long COVID, blood clotting, for example, autoimmunity or dysregulated immune response, dysbiosis of the microbiome, uh, and also some problem in uh, neurological signaling, and we do need to better understand that. Treatments also, we need treatments, there are not a lot of treatments. Uh, trying to get there. Some people would argue that we have seen that in certain cases getting a vaccine might improve your condition, and we have seen the other way around. Uh, so we do believe that we need to understand better, especially that you know some would argue that the virus can stay within your body uh, six months or even more, as several reports have shown. The other pandemic, and I will address that quite quickly, again, that's not new, Unfortunately, this is a drawing okay, from 200 years ago that if you get Jenner's vaccine, you will turn into a cow, okay? Vaccine, vaccinia, etc., etc. Or uh, here is Jenner feeding the cow with a lot of young and healthy babies. But again, we do remember that uh, uh, 
there was some opposition, depends on the country. The problem is, of course, as you discussed also, Itai, misinformation and disinformation. These are two different things. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but you do see that false information will reach more people faster uh, than true than the truth. So it's a problem. We need to address that. Here, for example, this is, as I understand, a uh, 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 Norwegian specialist that I know personally. <laughs> so again, conspiracy theories, we, are, we know that it exists. The question is why? Why spread rumor? Some people do believe that. It's OK. It's OK. But some people make profit out of that. Uh, some famous names, like, for example, Joseph Mercola, uh, is selling, you know, promoting, you know, uh, his own uh, 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 remedies, if I remember, and books, etc., and food. And, for example, he warned that the unvaccinated might soon be imprisoned by the government in camps. So, again, we know that it did it not happen. We had also our share in Israel. Uh, I remember it was Zelenko, I think, in the States that said that 2.2 billion people will die because of the vaccines, etc., etc. But again, uh, you can make a lot of money uh, by selling, uh, 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 or selling, not selling, telling false information. It's very easy. You utilize, you can utilize social media. You can exploit information gaps. Unfortunately, we are scientists. Not once, not twice on, you know, on the radio, on TV, I said, I do not know. I think we need to say we do not know when we do not know. And people can, of course, take advantage of that. Uh, you know, sometimes there is a kernel of truth. And then around that, you will build something. You exaggerate things. Uh, and again, it's a problem that we need to address. But nonetheless, COVID has become... I would say, a disease that we live with. I'm tempted to say endemic to some extent, but it doesn't mean that it went away. COVID is not over. The state of emergency is over, but COVID is here, and we need to get prepared. Uh, again, that was by the WHO. If I were to give you the talk at the original date, I couldn't have uh, brought you uh, those uh, slides, but yes, we ended the quarantine requirement. But we have to be aware of the future. Future is that COVID is freely circulating in animals. You remember the minks in Denmark. You remember perhaps that outbreak in Hong Kong that went from the Netherlands, Netherlands through hamsters to Hong Kong. It was impressive, but it happens. And uh, you know, uh, between 50 to 80 percent of the deals, I think, are in the states uh, have had COVID. So at some point, as we know, with I guess other viruses like flu, it will, it may come back to us. And also, you know, uh, the play, you know, the research, and it's more in our, uh, I would say field, uh, you know, playing with the viruses, when you make an hybrid of a virus, an Omicron virus with the original spike, etc., etc., you can kill, for example, 100% of the hamsters, etc. So again, we have to be also very careful when we study COVID. So in, in conclusion, in the global world, as I told you, viruses spread fast. There will be, we don't know when, other pandemics, again, we were not ready enough. We need to be ready. We need to invest in research and healthcare. Vaccines can be developed fast, but we can do that, I believe, faster if we have the necessary structure. And we need to take care of vaccine equity because at the end of the day, this pandemic has shown us that whatever is happening in South Africa can happen here. And whatever is happening in, in uh, India will also happen in the UK. And we need to main maintain the trust of the people and fight disinformation and misinformation. And we need to avoid at all costs lockdowns and think about, and again, it's very important education for our kids. Last lesson, viruses are not racist. They do not discriminate and they affect everyone, especially in a time in Israel when the society is quite polarized and I'm deeply 
concerned by what is happening, we need to remember that people can work together and need to work together, and we are all together in this. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.